Hello, everybody. My name is Jacob Shekler, and we have a guest here today, Robert Chemin. Robert Chemin is an international speaker. He's an expert in real estate, uh, specialized in personal development, real estate, and financial analyst, a frequent guest in the world's leading radio and television stations like CNN, NBC, EBS, ABS, BBC, Fox News, and many others. Creative author of 18 books, 18 still, or more? Maybe 19. 19 books, okay. And his, in one of his best sellers is How Come That Idiot's Rich and I'm Not. And he's also an owner of more than 1,000 investments. And actually, that person, Robert, is, is amazing because I'm, I've met him a couple of times, we met. Actually, he's also my mentor. And he's the most modest person that I know. And that's true. And so, Robert, first of all, thank you for being here with me and, and this interview. It's a new podcast which I'm starting, which is called Unleash Your Mind. And the purpose of that podcast is to help people to start thinking a different way, to see how they can achieve their results, results like you achieved in your life. And, and you started, you have a different story. You started different because that idiot, how that idiot reached, and I'm not, is based, is telling also your story. And I have your book here. Oh, look at that. Yeah, the one that you gave me in, in Miami Beach, in, including with your signature inside. So, <laughs> you can say. Super to see you in South Beach. Remember, if you are happy, you are rich. Enjoy it all. See you <laughs> soon. So since that book, we've seen we've seen a couple of times. We met a couple of times. And I want to share some piece of information, which I think most people are not aware of it. Okay. okay? You're a philanthropist. And, but there are many people in your level and, and say that are helping and, and giving others but you're doing it a different way. You participating, actually. You personally going and helping people, not only just sitting in your home or office donating money. So can you share about this? Well, it's funny. I'm in Medellin, Colombia right now, and you're in Valencia, Spain. España, la madre patria, una ciudad favorita mía. I love Spain. I'm uh, from Nashville, Tennessee, but I'm in Medellin, Colombia right now. I have a charity here, two of them now. We've actually grown a lot. And the last night until uh, 1 a.m., I was on the streets uh, with my charity, getting uh, street kids, uh, getting them food, getting them into our shelters. Um, and nobody knows my charity. I was out with the group. And I was in some pretty uh, rough areas last night. It's kind of crazy. But um, I was on the streets when I was a kid for a year. So I have a real empathy for street children. But, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, people, can, you can, people love to say they like to help others. And a lot of people, my friends say, oh, I don't have any money. Well, go give time. Go spend an hour at another shelter. Go 30 minutes with an old person, uh, something. So I do both. Um, I have the money now, so I fund a lot of the charities, but also go out because the only way in business you're going to learn is be with the customers, the clients. Um, and our customers are clients with so the charity, are homeless children, very uh, poor, uh, mainly single moms, pregnant teenagers, and we have a holistic program. And... Um, Unleash your mind. The my own food shelter. We show them how to start a business, how to think right, how to uh, live better, how to be happier, and it works. So why Colombia? Which is well, well huh? I have no idea. I love to travel. I've been to eighty countries, and uh, many years ago, I was a diplomat in Latin South American human rights, and uh, I came to Colombia, and I fell in love with it the first day. Um, I've lived in Costa Rica, Nicaragua. I've been all over. Uh, as you know, I'm in Israel every two, three months. I'm going to Russia soon. I just love traveling, but just great down here. And you can have a big impact. I also, I'm American. I love America. I live in Miami. I'm from Nashville. I uh, also have a big charity there called Student Financial League, SFL.org, where we teach underprivileged kids, tough kids, uh, 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 trafficked women, the language of money uh, so they can be uh, successful. You have a story. I remember that you were talking about a young girl that you picked up and from the street. Well, the, the organization, your organization, 
And then she grew up 18. She was doing a bracelet, something like. Yeah, here's one of her bracelets. I always wear one. Yeah. So yeah, she, uh, yeah. Amazing girl. So her name's Zach. Can you share a story, please? A yeah. Uh, I could spend hours um, talking about her. So, you know, everybody, I used to think, well, you know, these kids are on the street. They have no food, no family. Some of them have shoes. They're, uh, I'd say, 100% sexually abused, uh, sexually exploited. Uh, most of them are sniffing shoe glue, uh, uh, Pegasaco cement. Uh, they buy these little black baggies for a, like a penny, a peso, nothing here, and they sniff them, and it whacks their mind out. So uh, this girl, she um, uh, one day when we got with the charity with the kids, we bring the graduates of the program because they've been on the streets and they they can talk to the kids easier than we can, you know. And one day her and her cousin, who I knew from the charity, came out. And they're like kids, and I'm an American, and they're like, oh, we want to talk to you, we want to talk to you, we want to tell you our story. And like everybody, we all do this every day. I'm busy, we're with the charity. And I was kind of annoyed a little bit by the girls. I'm like, listen, I know everyone's, you don't want to talk, we're busy, I'll talk to you later. How many times do we all do that every day? And I try not to, but I did it. Oh, we want to talk to you, we to tell your story. Yeah, yeah, whatever, later, later, later. Finally, about one in the morning, we're done with our, what we're doing, and the girls are still bothering me. I'm kind of bothered a little bit, which I shouldn't be, but I was. And I say, you know what? I'm just going to take a minute and listen to them. So we sat down on the curb, and you know me and you, I like to talk. And I sat there for three hours. She told me her story, and I didn't say a word. <laughs> it was like the most – and this girl at that time was 15, uh, maybe 15 and a half, 16. She'd been in our charity about a, uh, a year. and she had a way of talking and she was never negative. She never complained. I mean, think about how we all complain about her, you know, I had a bad relationship, I had a bad day, uh, whatever. This girl, all the things we teach, you know, unleash the mind, whatever I teach, you know, be positive, have a good, she just had it. I don't know where she got it from. She goes, but uh, she was 15 or, or, four, or 11, excuse me. They took her from her house, which is common here. Uh, they told her mom they're going to kill the family if they don't, they took her and put her in a brothel. Uh, human trafficked, I guess, horrible. These are mafia. They kill people. Everybody knows it. And she was 11 or 12 or whatever. And she said, I looked in the eye and she goes, uh, I'm not a prostitute. I'm not going to work in your brothel to these mafia guys with guns who kill everybody. 11, 12 year old girl. And they go, what are you talking about? We'll kill you. And she goes, I'm a child of God. Uh, I'm not a prostitute. She goes, listen, uh, you know, I know you got me but I'm very organized. I'll make you more money if you let me run the brothel and do the bookkeeping and the cleaning and organizing. And she convinced them um, that that happened. Anyway, one of the other stories was she, uh, a year or two later, she was stuck in there. She tried to escape. They beat her. She couldn't leave. Um, she was uh, attacked and raped uh, violently. And uh, she, the, the gang guys grabbed the guy that, they found the guy that raped her and brought them into like a place and said, this is the guy that raped you. She goes, yep. Yeah. And he goes, you're going to kill him. And they gave her a gun and said, kill him. And they go, this is how it works in this neighborhood. And everybody knows that. And she goes, I'm not going to kill anybody. I'm a child of God. I'm not a murderer. I'm a child of God. So are you. I'm not killing anybody. They go, well, if you don't kill him, we're going to kill you. And people were, there were witnesses. Her cousin was there and she just stared him down and said, I'm not killing anybody. You're not going to kill me. I'm a child of God. I'm great. I'm fine. Everything's good. Don't worry about me. I, I forgive him. I forgive you. And they didn't kill her, a miracle. Anyway, uh, a while later, uh, they drugged her up. Uh, one of our vans came, and one day I said, well, how'd you come to the charity? She said, I, well, I didn't. I go, what do you mean? She said, they drugged me up. I was standing on the street. Your van pulled up, and I fell in it. <laughs> she, like, collapsed in the van. Accident, serendipity. She goes, they brought me to their charity. I, I was safe here. They fed me. It took me a, a month or so to get off the drugs and the glue and the rehab and all that. And uh, anyway, uh, we teach 48 businesses. We taught her to make bracelets. And uh, she started making bracelets. And uh, she goes, uh, uh, they don't, we don't give money. Uh, they have to get their own money. These are homeless kids, but they live with us. She went out and got, I think, uh, I think she told me 10,000 pesos, like three U.S. dollars, you know, what a shekel, uh, what, two euros, whatever, I don't know. And uh, she bought uh, six strings, six things of beads and sold them for 20,000 pesos, which was like five or six dollars. And then she did it again and again. And she goes, I I'm at school. I'm, I was 15, 16, making like uh, three, 400 bucks a month with y'all, which down here's that's a national salary, part-time. Wow. 
Then one day, one of the kids got, uh, another kid that we know got uh, uh, stabbed. He almost died. She made a bracelet. She's very religious, spiritual. She prayed on it, and she uh, went to the hospital, stuck in the intensive care, put it on him, and made some prayers, and he survived. He miraculously uh, jumped out of bed the next day. Uh, the doctor said he's going to die. And all these people started saying her bracelets are pulsetas de benedicciones, blessed bracelets. So now she has like 50, 60 girls making bracelets. They say uh, prayers on them. There's groups of five that say prayers on the bracelets. And she always asks me, don't sell my bracelets. We can't make enough of them. <laughs> um, That's amazing. People kind of buy them. And he's like, no, we're, we're, they're backed up. They can't make them enough. And she runs this business. And she sometimes makes eight to fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a month. She's uh, she's now almost nineteen, and um, uh, her story is amazing. She she's one of those people that just decides something and does it. She's very clear of mind. I've never really met anybody like her. She's never been educated. She was in school with us for a little bit. Never had mentors. Never had school. Never had parents. She now supports her whole family. Um, amazing girl. Yeah. And uh, to me, she's a. Um, a real representation of the power of thought. And I asked her when I said, you were around rapes and murders and drugs and brothels in the worst neighborhood, and probably one, one of the worst neighborhoods in the world, you know, the worst part of the, the, the ghettos, the, the really bad areas here. I said, did you ever like feel down or like get up depressed or upset? I mean, everybody does. She's like, no, she goes, I never really thought about it. She goes, I just thought happy thoughts and uh, did my own business and didn't really pay attention to all negativity. A lot of negativity around me didn't pay attention to it. Didn't connect to it. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> that's an amazing story. That's amazing. I knew the story with the bracelet, but I never knew all the whole details of the story. Yeah. And, and her cousin, who was there too, is the same story, just real one minute. She was like 15 at the time or on the curb. And she looked me in the eye and she goes, I'm going to be a famous musician DJ. And I'm the most open-minded, positive person you ever meet. And I'm like, oh, that's nice. And I'm thinking, you're a street girl. I'm sorry. There's no way that's happening. But hey, it's nice to have a dream. I didn't tell her that. But you know, we all had those thoughts, those limiting thoughts. Yeah. Her name is uh, DJ Deborah. She tours the world now. She's 17, 18. She's playing all over the place, making tons of money. I don't know how she did it. Oh, and Daniela told me one day, she goes, I'm going to go to New York and be a very important businesswoman. And I'm like, okay. You're a 15, 14 year old street girl. You don't speak English or you can't get a visa. A, a business guy kid down here can't get a visa in the US now. And guess what she got this year? A visa. A visa. And she taught herself English in a year using a, a program on the phone. She speaks great English now. Wow. I went to school. I didn't learn Spanish. I tried to learn Spanish. It took a long time. <laughs> you know, power of the mind, power of thought. The power of thought. But you know, this. This, that's amazing. This story is amazing. Actually, to start with, because it's not really important when the people are born. It's not important what the, the situation, the condition that they have. And actually, it seems that the more they have, the more they complain. The more possibility human have is the more they complain. I think there, there might be some of that. Because I'm around these street people all the time and really poor people here in Colombia and other places. And they really don't complain. They don't complain because there's nothing to complain about. They, 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 they don't have it. But well, they ask the folks on what they have. They, you know, they say, oh, I've got some friends. I had uh, something to eat today. I've got a job. I'm, uh, you know, I, you know, I got something to drink you know, last night. Or, you know, they're, 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 they don't focus on what they don't have. They focus on what they have. And it's really amazing. There might be something to what you're saying uh, because uh, we're all spoiled rotten. And I, I know I am. And we uh, complain sometimes. <laughs> no, we, yes, we can complain, but I think it's, I think, I think, I, I'm thinking with you right now openly, and, and I think that the attitude, this attitude is because the more you have to lose, the more you complain. The more you complain, and complain, the less complain. You have to do, like those kids. Like those kids. There's echo here. There's I echo know, here. It's it. Well, and also I will say, so I've been on the streets and if you don't, you won't lose it. Like I know when I had like a half a sandwich and I was on the streets, I would like kill somebody if they took the half a sandwich. <laughs> you, know, you don't want to lose what you have, but there's something to it. One of the most shocking moments of my life, uh, I think life's a series of moments. I was in Haiti after the earthquake where they were helping some people. It was horrible. There was no food. It was really, really, really bad. And I had to fly to Miami and get on a cruise ship and give a speech to a real estate group. 
So within 18 hours, I went from being in a village with no food. I went a day without food. People had nothing. And I flew up to Miami, went on this luxurious cruise ship. And the first hour they had, have you ever been on a cruise ship with the buffets? No, but the, no, no. It's unlimited buffets, like all day, all night. Yes. And I'm on this buffet and I'm really hungry. And there's, a, there's, there's like a, a 20 meters of food, you know, everything, three meats, 20 desserts, 50 salads. Amazing. And I'm like, wow. And this lady in front of me goes, oh, my God, I don't like the way they did the chicken. There's nothing to eat. There's nothing good on this salad bar. I don't like this. I don't like this cruise. I don't like the buffet. It's no yeah. good. It's too crowded. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I'm violent, but I wanted to hit her. And I would never do that. But I'm just, it's just amazing. It's all in our heads. It's all in our heads. It's all. What are your daily habits? Well, it's funny. I'm working on that all the time. Um, I, I, I know what they should be, and I do them most of the time. Um, I try to exercise uh, five times a week, something, and I mix it up. Um, I also read an hour or two a day the first thing. So, you read basic, so you, what time do you wake up usually? I wake up. I grew up on a farm, and no matter how late I stay up, if I stay up till 3 in the morning, which I did the other night, um, I get up at 5, 5.30. Wow. So you, can you deal your life, live your life with two or three hours sleep? Uh, yes, but it's not good. I, uh, I, I do usually get uh, four to six, seven hours of sleep, but I, can, I do it sometimes and I feel great. And then in the afternoon, I take uh, 20, 30, 40 minutes to do some type of meditation, siesta or binaural beats. Mm, that's excellent. That's excellent. Yeah, I do the visual and the audio or some type of meditation. I try in the morning, some people call prayer, some people call meditation, do that, focus on the goals for the day, and then I'm usually booked up most days and nights, but I love what I do, so I don't know if I'm working or not. I don't really think I work. People say I'm busy all the time and working all the time, but I don't, to me, it's not work, it's fun. It's not exactly. That's what think. I'm saying the same thing because for me, it's my passion. Doing hypnosis, it's passion. So it's you know, I think about it. Everybody goes, oh, I work nine to five. You know, back... Uh, Come on, you somebody lived on a farm and you're with your family and you farmed, you took care of the animals, you did whatever you maybe made of uh, shoes or something, but you didn't try to go off working. Your kind of life was your life. You mix the family, the work, uh, sure. the religion, the, whatever you're doing. There's no now it's all like, oh, I'm, you know, clocked in, clocked out. I'm, I hate what I do. I love what I do. Uh, yeah. People, I tell people, I don't think I work. I mean, they say I work, but I really don't feel like it. I love speaking, teaching, helping. Um, writing, creating, um, and I block time. I'm a big uh, uh, focus. I think it's a challenge for everybody now uh, in business and life. Uh, people are pulled so many directions, uh, you know, with the phones and the emails, the bombardment of information. Huge um, distraction. So if you look, I'm, I'm a big believer in blocking time. One hour to this, do this one thing, uh, one hour to write, one hour to read, uh, this podcast. Uh, to, and you have to take time for yourself. People don't do that anymore. They're burning themselves out. So basically what you say, when you work on something, you take something, you take an hour, you work on that, and then you change it. So basically you're never bored. Nope. It's told off. And I've been bored since uh, like uh, 11 years old. <laughs> yes, because you're active. So, in, in, and if we talk about the, the, the old days, the past days, when you became, before you became the famous Robert Chairman, okay, <laughs> and... What were your inner strengths those days? That, 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 so go ahead. Sorry. No, it was a, what was my inner strengths? Yeah. You know, it's funny. Um, this kind of sounds kind of strange. I feel like I was pretty much born happy. I don't know. I mean, I've done studies. I don't know if it's genetic, chemical, biochemical uh, attitude or just, I, I think I worked on it. You know, I had rough times. I had a, a, a really weird childhood. I uh, had dyslexia. I didn't walk. I couldn't speak. Uh, I didn't go to school for a while. I flunked out of school. I got a lot of trouble. Uh, to me, it was fun. Uh, to other people, you know, uh, uh, was a problem. <laughs> so, you know, I did a lot of crazy stuff. Um, but I never really seemed bothered by it. I just always had a good attitude. I always looked at life as an adventure, uh, uh, fun challenges. Uh, I love people. So I just looked at everything like as, a, as kind of almost a game. And I had fun playing the game. And even though I had some, you know, rough times, I, I think that was my big inner strength. And, um, uh, and I've always liked meeting people. And the other thing is 
for some reason, I always liked hanging around older people and learning. Even though I wasn't learning in school, even though I have dyslexia, I could read. So when I was flunking all my classes, I would skip class and I read every book in the library. I read encyclopedias. Wow. Kind of strange. That's amazing. And I always love meeting older people and hanging out with them and learning from them, hearing their stories. I love, to me, everybody was a book, like a story. Even today, like uh, uh, the taxi, my favorite thing in Colombia to do is driving taxis. To talk with I, them, to speak with I mean, them. I could, uh, you know, people, the street people, the guy selling hot dogs, the lady at the counter, the rich guy, the poor guy, the whatever. And, and I think, I don't know about, I think it's been my biggest inner strength. I just, I've always enjoyed that. I got to give my mother a lot of credit. My parents were completely different. My mother was super social to the day she passed. She'd go walk in the restaurants, kiss the baby, talk to the people, meet somebody. Uh, and you don't have to be an extrovert because I was also introverted for a long time. And I do, I, and people don't realize this, I spent a lot of time by myself. I love being by myself. So I love being with people, but also am introverted also. Yeah. So I don't know. I think it's an, an inner strength. And uh, I always, um, and, I, and then I've had some really bad experience. The last thing I'll say is I also realized that your life is a choice. And I realized I made bad choices. I tried that. <laughs> I could, you know, we and, all do that. Yeah. And I, I figured out a pretty early age, like it's a choice. And at some point, maybe I was 16, 17, I really decided I'm going to be happy. And it was a choice because before I wasn't so happy. And it's, and it was a conscious choice. Um, uh, you know, I want to be healthier and, uh, you know, smarter in certain ways. And it was just a choice. And you follow through with action. And um, I'm a big action taker. I do think a lot. I have overthink thought stuff. I worry about stuff like everybody. But I just um, say, let's get started. How do we start this? How do we get going? Let's just do it. And I love a challenge. Always looking for a new challenge. <laughs> that's, that was going my, to be my next question, but I want to tell you a story about that thing that you mentioned with the driver, the taxi driver, because I like to do the same thing here in Valencia. And I've been Saturday in Barcelona, and I, took a, I had a taxi driver, and I was happy because he was from India. My mother was born in India. Yeah. And I said, oh, that's nice. And I start talking, asking questions. He said, sir, I don't like all these questions. <laughs> okay, sorry, fine. <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> like, hey, let's go. You don't like all this question? It was you know, it's funny. One of my favorite things, and I say this with love and respect, my girlfriend, because I'm a speaker and I talk, you like to talk. My favorite thing she says to me, Robert, stop talking. <laughs> Just for a little bit. Stop listening. <laughs> you got to listen to people. And I really respect her. Key relationship. What are the taxi driver? You? Hey, I, I like questions. I don't like questions. Absolutely. People are scared to tell people what they want, and I, my respect for her goes up. And she's right. Like, let's just be <laughs> quiet for thirty minutes an hour. It's a beautiful thing. Yep, absolutely. So, what are your inner challenges? <laughs> Dude, I can tell you, Robert, stop talking. The podcast is over. No, talk, Robert. Talk. That's you. That's what I want you to do. <laughs> okay. Say that, Robert, we're done. Stop talking. Okay. I'll go ahead. What are my inner challenges? Yes. You know, it's a, it's a great question. Always trying to improve, always trying to be better. But one of the challenges is when you meet your goals, it's almost depressing. True. Because then you need to plan another one. I really wonder about some of my really successful friends, rock stars and billionaires and millionaires I've gotten to meet. You know, they have the number one selling album or the number one book, correct? Um, and, um, uh, I'll never forget, uh, kind of a funny story. And I, I hate to mention his name for some people, but if you're open, you'll learn. Uh, my book agent was Trump's book agent. When Donald Trump's a big book came out, mm -hmm. uh, Larry, uh, uh, Kirschbaum, great book agent, a legend of the book business. My book was coming out and, uh, I said, well, congratulations on your book with Trump. It's like number one in the world. It did this and that. I said, what'd you learn from that? He goes, you know, Trump is an interesting guy. He goes, I called Donald Trump, who's now president. He said, Donald, your book is number one. Congratulations. It's on the top of the charts. And guess what Donald Trump said to him? I'll never forget what Larry told me. He goes, Larry, we have to do better. And hung the phone up. Really? And the book agent said, well, how can you be better than number one? And he calls him back and says, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, can we be number one longer than somebody else? Can we set a new record? Can we do this? Can we do that? 
And that's what I like to say is I've met some of my goals financially, personally, and then it's like, okay, what do we do now? <laughs> What's the next challenge? Yeah. And I take time off and think about it. I'm now starting a new business, another business, transforming another thing. This You've got to have a new challenge, uh, whether it's exercise, diet, take it to the next level. Um, and that's probably my biggest inner challenge is um, what's the next challenge? What's going to get me excited and passionate about it? And I, I find it. I might have something for you. I okay. Might, I might have something for you. Yep. So and results. And then also, it's also very important just to be. I think that's the biggest inner challenge is I got to catch myself sometimes. It's not what you do or what your activity is or results. It's a balance. So just being happy, being uh, uh, a good person, being uh, fulfilled, uh, that to me is also very important. So is that it's always, I think life's about a balance. Yeah. You know, you can go out and achieve, achieve, goal, 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 challenge, challenge, challenge. Also being. You know, one of the things which I liked in the book and the way it starts, it says, no one ever succeeds alone. That's the way it starts. Yeah. Can you explain well, that? I agree with that, but can you explain that? I used to grow up and read about my heroes, uh, you know, Da Vinci, the guy who painted the Sistine Chapel, um, uh, these amazing inventors, you know, Edison, and people that changed the world. I've just thrown out a couple of names, probably not the best. And I go, wow, they did this by themselves. <laughs> you know, amazing. Yeah. And then you read, like, the guy that painted the Sistine Chapel had like 280 uh, team members painting and planning and uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. They say that Gandhi, you know, who was sitting there changing the world, you know, uh, weaving, uh, talking mm -hmm. about nonviolence, had like 80 people that worked with him, you know, yeah. that took care of him and did whatever they need to do. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Apple, Steve Jobs, I mean, great guy, amazing, but, you know, he had a huge company. Um, I asked somebody the other day about Elon Musk, who knows him. I said, how does this guy get everything out of goes, He's got the best people implementing his amazing ideas. And it's all about the team. And I, um, everything I do, you know, everybody wants to do it themselves. So I got to go do this myself. And I say, you know what? You're the leader. You can do it, but you're going to need experts. And I just always ask, um, who can I call or get that knows better than me? I just find the experts. And by the way, I've done both. I've uh, worked with family, friends, and people that I liked and thought were good and didn't check them out. They were not good team members, and we had bad business. Uh, it's all about people, uh, the group, and uh, it, nobody's successful on their own. So the first time I met my mentor who got me into real estate, he said something that, that really I didn't understand and blew my mind. Uh, because a lot of us have analysis of paralysis. We're thinking all the time, how do I do it? What if I fail? What if it works? What if it doesn't work? I don't understand this. I don't know. I got to learn everything. And he said uh, to me, he called me Bobby. He's like, Bobby, you want to know everything about everything before you get started. He goes, I don't want to do anything. I just want to find out who I can call and get the answer. <laughs> true, true. And I thought it was genius. And that's the way you teach, actually, the, the real estate. Build a team. Yeah, the build a team. Most successful people have an amazing team. In, uh, one, in the music business, ask one of my friends. I was at the, uh, 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 one of the big award shows. And I went... There's a million great musicians. How come this one, it was Beyonce, who's amazing, is winning all the awards on every cover of every magazine. And my friend who's in the music business who knows says because she has 30 or 40 people, the most amazing, best team that wake up every day and say, how do we make her look good? How do we make her sound good? How do we help her? How do we get her on the news? So I ask people, who's your team? Yeah. And for a long time, my team was me. <laughs> That's the way we start. But that's always a start because even today, okay, let's take if we take the story of that girl that you helped her, she was alone. And then when she, jo when she joined the team and she started getting all the information, that helped her as well. Yeah. She could move forward. Yeah, she had the, the, the it's called for like they taught her how to run a business and they made her do things. And then she went and found other people that were as motivated as her, that, you know, all these girls. And it's really amazing to watch, just sit and watch them make and they pray. They're very serious. But she's the leader and she's got a, got a bunch of other leaders now. A, a good leader builds leaders. It's the yeah. hardest thing to do for an entrepreneur, for uh, a person. We all have ego uh, to let go because they go, oh, they won't do it as good as I will. Well, you're probably right, but they're going to do other things better than you do, too. It's ego. Oh, if I don't do it, I won't get done. I have that ego, too, sometimes, and uh, it's control issues. 
And you can ask, where do they come from? It all comes from insecurity. Mm -hmm. So what, if you're talking about insecurity, so how come, how come that when you were young and in your book, you, were, you wanted, when you went to the psychologist, the school psychologist, you wanted him to find that you're an idiot. Or oh, that's what yeah. you said, though. No. It's true. Uh, it's, yeah. Um, so in school, I was so crazy and doing crazy stuff. They actually uh, made me get a, uh, it was obviously the only, there's two kids in my school. One uh, was a criminal who shot somebody and me. And the school paid for a counselor to come to my school and give me counseling. They told my parents that, you know, I need counseling. And um, again, I viewed it as a fun game. My cousin, Kenny at the time, he's a very close friend of mine. He's an amazing lawyer. He was studying psychology in university. Now I'm in eighth grade, maybe seventh grade. And I read his psychology books. And I, he was the only one I told what I was doing. And I convinced the therapist that I was schizophrenic. It was like a game for me. And he but called why? my parents. But why? Why you wanted to do that? Entertain myself. I think I was bored. On that? Listen, <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of us are bored. We all have addictions, working, sex, drugs, alcohol, a sport, a something. We're bored. We don't like to be with ourselves. Maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing. I was bored, I was bored at school, and I found things to entertain myself. What, you know, everybody finds something to distract themselves. For me, back then, it was a fun and crazy fun challenge. And the funny thing was kind of, a, uh, what do you call it, a, a, a ironic. They called my parents in, and said, your son's schizophrenic. And I'm like, oh, this is great. I won. I you know, won my game. And then my dad says, listen, I know my son. I think he's fooling you. And he read his cousin's books. My dad was a very smart guy. And I think he's uh, fooling you. And I was in the meeting. And then the psychiatrist said, well, if he's convincing me he's schizophrenic, then he's really crazy. <laughs> so maybe I'm really crazy. But I will tell you this. I don't want to be normal. I don't like normal. So maybe we're all flipping crazy. I'd rather be crazy. And I guess it was a choice. Always a choice, as you said before. I, I find schizophrenia fascinating. In a way, yes. It depends what kind, what, what's the angle you're looking at it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think everybody's got stuff and, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. So, um, so if he was right, I'm happy because I'm a high functioning schizophrenic. And if he's not right, I'm still happy because it was a fun game. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot. I studied the ink blotter test. If you see bats, you're crazy. I saw a lot of bats. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome to Valencia. That's the law. That's the signed emblem of the city. But you know, it's also interesting. Everything's a gateway, as you know. That incident opened my mind up to mental health, studying psychology, how the mind works, uh, success, happiness, hypnosis. I, everything happens for a reason. Absolutely, that, everything. If I would have been then to that counseling, I may not have ever become a motivational speaker, or written a book, or learned uh, what I did. I don't because know. it's all blocks that we build during our life that brings us to our situation. I w I've been 22 years ago in a situation, in a crisis situation, that I wanted to end my life. Yeah. And that changed my life, actually. That's brought me where I am now. At the time, it's the worst thing. And at the end, it lends me an okay thing or a good thing. You Absolutely. Learn yeah. Absolutely. It's, um, so what was, the, what was the inner thing that put you, the energy that put you against your, the odds, like moving yourself forward? So, I, you know, uh, when someone asks me a question, I'll try to give a, a, as good an answer as possible. My mother also said, tell the truth. I think in the beginning it was for the wrong reasons. Um, I think I wanted uh, attention. Um, I was bored. I think everyone has insecurities. I liked attention. Um, I liked all that stuff. And then um, I think that drove me a lot because, you know, we all don't get enough attention, whether it's at home or this or that. We have emptiness. And then later I realized that and I changed my intention saying, I don't need to do this stuff to get attention. I'm happy with myself and I'm just going to do it what I want to do. And, from a healthier point of view but i think i was i was a teenager kid you know it's cra crazy times i think a lot of it was um searching wanting attention i didn't know how to get it other ways so i did you know some crazy stuff to get attention and it worked yeah. and i found it completely entertaining uh some people found it fun shocking i got in trouble a lot but then that's not a the healthiest way to do it then i switched to hopefully a healthier way 
When Even I think a lot of entertainers and speakers and actors and myself as a speaker, we love attention, correct? Absolutely, yeah. It's like an addiction. And, you know, I studied stuff, learned, developed, and now I don't do it for those reasons, do it for other reasons that are more genuine and sincere. So you always have to ask yourself, why am I really doing this? And, you know, you know, as, I, as you are a master hypnotist, I'm a master hypnotist, I think everything comes from subconscious. You know, I want attention. Am I getting enough attention? So here, give me some attention. Yeah, well, because I'm working also with the past life times, so I'm thinking it's coming, it's a pattern, like what I call them, the scars that coming from previous lives, but that's part of it, and it's a different story. You know, we are talking about that fear is, is one of the biggest uh, stumbling blocks of, of most people. Yeah. Uh, what do you think is, from your perspective, what causes the majority of people to stuck in the life or, or not doing what they're supposed to do? So, you know, fear is a really interesting topic. Sometimes I hate it and sometimes I love it. Which is today. What are you, no. Where are you today? You love it or hate it? I don't know because we all have fears and um, some fears are great motivators. You know, pain, fear. I think a lot of very successful people started like myself with a lot of fear, pain, and security. So I, I don't want to say it's all bad because it, it created some amazing results and motivation and stuff. However, uh, people are frozen. That's a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, fear. All fears are irrational. We overthink things. 90% of what we fear never happens. Correct? True. And I think every decision is based from uh, love or fear. <laughs> uh, you know, why, why am I making this decision? So fear, what are people really scared of? Well, I'm going to look bad. I'm going to fail. I'm going to make a mistake. I used to think all those things. Now I realize nobody really cares that much <laughs> whether you fail or succeed. People are so busy in their own mind. We're trying to please our partner, our mom, our dad, our friends, the world. Nobody really cares. <laughs> I thought they're all thinking about me. They're really not, whether I'm failing or succeeding. Right? Yeah, but fear, I think, I, I think again that it's leading to the, the answer is leading to what we started, that the fear of losing things, of yes. what we have. So that's main, most of the things, and especially those who have, those yeah. who have property, those who have value in, the, in their life, those who have money, are afraid of changing situation. Yeah, I think fear... Is, the, is one of the biggest motivators of fear of loss. I think it's the biggest motivator, fear of not being included, fear of, of losing. And, you know, where's all come from? It's, it's stupid. It's insecurities. It's, it's, it's sure. crazy. And I think, you know, a lot of it's chemical. Our brains are wired after millions of years in the forest. You know, I don't want to get eaten by a tiger or the other natives, or I don't have any food. Correct. Yeah. True. And to this day, um, uh, even me, you know, I got a lot of money now. I used to have no money. And sometimes someone will take a, I'll lose a, a $2. So, <gasps> and I start panicking. I'm like, it's $2. $2. I'm going to live. I'm, I'm going to eat today. I'm gonna, I got a place to stay. I'm, why is my brain going, <laughs> you know, in that uh, fight or flight mode, uh, that panic mode, the fear mode, right? And I, I think a lot of it, you have to overcome that. You, it, until you, uh, I'm working on this a lot. I read a, a, a great quote that I, all the technology we have, you know, is amazing. The last 20 years, it's amazing. But nobody's taught us how to control our emotions. Fear, insecurity. That's the, exactly the technology is not advanced one. You know, it's there, the hypnosis, the meditation, the books, the courses, the mentoring, you know. But nobody really is doing it that much. I have clients, male especially, male clients, that whatever happens, and I had a couple of them already, and all of them are trying to trick me because they don't want to show, they don't want to expose themselves. And, and it's like, women are more open in that. Okay, we they say, look, okay. We, we want to look good, right? Yeah. Fear Something of looking like scared. that, yeah, Fear. yeah. So they are not open, but women are much open and, and can share with me and tell because I, I told my client, listen, 
He said, you're here to help me. So I need your answer. I said, yeah, but I need your help to tell me what you need so I can help you in that, achieving that. You know, statistically, 80% of self-help book buyers are women. 80% of users of mental health services are women, correct? And I'm sorry, I'm a, you know, I'm a dumb guy. I'm okay. I don't want to look bad. I want to look good to my friends. Yeah. You know, I don't want to look weak. I don't want to look uh, whatever. It's stupid. It is. It is. It's yeah. actually. So we're, go we're getting to the, the last question. Uh-oh. What is that? You knew that. Okay, what is the best tip that you can give for people that they want to change their life and to move forward in their life? Uh, I think I'll, a great question, I'll, uh, a, a tough one, but I'll try to answer as best I can in a quick couple minutes, just quick. Um, Take your time. I did this last night with a friend of mine. I do a lot of high-end business life coaching, I don't know, like you do. Uh, and I said, wait a minute, let's stop for a minute. And where do you really want to be? in a year or two, not just money, not just health, lifestyle, relationship, religion, spirituality. Take a minute without setting a goal. All the super successful people I know have a very clear goal of what they want to accomplish. Um, kids, this homeless girl, in her mind, she's like, I'm going to do this. She has no doubt. Yeah. She's, there's, very rarely do we, not, do we have 100% clarity, of decision with our emotion, life, health, relationship, money, you know, but I'm going to eat breakfast today. That's a hundred percent clear. I'm getting something to eat. You know, I'm going to have a cup of coffee. I'm going to brush my teeth hundred percent. Right. Yeah. But well, I'm scared. I don't know if to start it. What if I, that she doesn't like me? What if he doesn't like me? What if it doesn't work? I think that clarity, the goal, whether it's a simple one, I want to make an extra hundred dollars, I want to start a business, I want to find a boyfriend, a girlfriend, whatever you're into, but be specific. Very specific, clear goal. It's one of the most challenging things for people to do, to commit to a real goal. True. Uh, because again, yes. the fear is coming. What if I fail? What if I'm successful? What if I look bad? What if I look good? What if people are jealous? What if I, you know, we're fear of failing. Uh, then number two is, what are the actions I need to take today that are going to get me there? Right? Where is 10 minutes, 20 minutes? Exercise. Uh, for a while I did, then I started with 20 minutes a day. Just do something, then 40 minutes, then whatever. Uh, just make a goal and, and take the action. Um, and then the other thing I think is we're social animals. Uh, we need somebody to support us, workout buddy, friend, counselor, accountability. It's easier to do it with somebody else, whether you're starting a business, going to the gym, making money, uh, doing a project, the right person. Um, I find it's always a lot, you know, one plus one, I think is always 11. I mean, I, you can do things on your own for sure. But I know like if I'm going to go to the, just a stupid example, go to the gym, it's always easier. I'm meeting a friend there. And the friend said, what'd you go? What'd you do? Did you write the book today? Did you, yeah. you know, make it a fun game. Um, and that's the other thing. And I'll say this too. The other thing, and, and I learned this from one of my mentors, uh, Reb Chaim Daskal, he said, yeah, it's great to set goals and achieve, but you don't have to do anything. <laughs> you don't have to do anything. When yeah. you start from, I woke up today, most, a lot of people didn't, I'm happy, I'm, uh, I'm good, I have a good life. It's much easier to start those things and say, my life sucks, I had a bad day, uh, I don't have this, I don't have that. The attitude. And you don't get it done that day, you don't beat yourself up. Mm -hmm. You know, we're always beating ourselves up. True. So it's that balance again, um, you know, of yes, I'm going to achieve, I got to set a goal, but I'm also okay. I'm starting from here and I'm not going to. Again, it's like being positive, but, but positive people made positive, like, like a mod, like a style. Okay. I need to be positive. So I'll talk positive, but it's not really talking about positive. It's being positive. Yeah. And, and that's more simple, but talking, it's easier. Yeah. <laughs> talking, it's easier. And, you know, um, you know, the goal setting, don't set too many goals. Set one, two, or three. A lot of people set 20 goals. It's unrealistic. And be realistic. You know, be very realistic with yourself. Don't over. Uh, and, and, and then what, what are the actions that have to be done to get that done? And when am I going to do them and schedule them? Because if we don't schedule more plan, it's not going to happen. True. It's simple True. stuff. Everybody's heard it, but the question is, are you doing it? And what's going to make you do it? Yeah. And there's got to be some question. accountability. And again, most of us need an outside accountability. And that's something I think people need. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Robert. Congratulations on your podcast. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that, at least like I did. Yeah. Because I did it, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you for your time. Congratulations on you listening to it, you know, for being open minded, and I hope you uh, learn some things and uh, apply them. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what yeah. I'm going to do. And I'll talk with you later. We'll chat. Okay. okay. Bien, gracias, amigo. Nos vemos pronto. Thank Nos you very vemos. much. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Everybody, much. be happy, uh, be healthy, and be successful. Thank you. Okay. Have a good day. Bye-bye.